Um, hi, I, uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about Sparkle and Unicode RDF, and how these can help uh, bioinformation efforts. And I'll start first by the very short history of Unicode RDF before going into uh, the quality issues and what Sparkle can bring as can our reason. So, Unicode data in its previous forms as SwissPod has been around for a long time. And you could see that it started in 1984, started with flat files, and uh, me personally, I was crawling around on the floor in diapers. And I don't know if people read the book 1984, where you have the concept of thought speak, and this is also true in flat file formats and biological databases. I'll just put this number in square brackets, and everybody will know that this is a public identifier and not an assemble accession number. So, okay, technology moves on. And yet, up in 2001, I go to university. Everybody is using XML technologies for their databases. And I don't know if you read the book, A Space Odyssey, where you have this monolithic technology, which really helps the evolution of your system. And at the end, the big monolith tries to kill you because it gets too big. So, in 2008, technology of the day is RDF. And I'm starting a real job. And I hope you all saw the movie Wally. Because in the end, somebody needs to clean up the mess that was left behind by all the other technologies. So, in 2008, Unipod started providing their data, all our data in RDF formats. You can get it every four weeks as we release on release day. You can download it from our website. But that's just RDF dump files. So, we're actually also going to provide a Sparkle endpoint this year. And you can test it this week at this address, but that will go as disappear after the presentation, after the, this week, so don't bookmark it too much. Our uh, license, data is licensed under CC Commons uh, license. But again, okay, it's really nice that you put it all in RDF, but you know, why bother? Why do this? Well, we find out that all our data is linked. Links are very important. Links internally in our data, links from our data to all the other databases, from input entries to DDBJ or DDBPDBJ. And we find that our data are graphs. They're not trees, they're not key value bases. It's really a graph structure. So making it a graph data is a really natural fit. We also have to deal with, as all of us do, that biology changes because we have different insights. When things change, we have to deal with the fact that biological data moves with the field. So we have new data, and our data format changes. So something that takes this change as a core concept for its design is really, really good. And you also have to deal with the fact that not everybody has large teams of developers working for that. So we have to make sure that what we use is easy to use and consistent to use, because not everybody can afford really integrating all the data that we really should be using. And if you look at how data integration has gone in the traditional sense, you know, you have three, two download files, you download some pathway file from somewhere, download some input data or EPJ data. Well, you have to parse it, you put it in your SQL database, so you have to make a schema, you have to maintain the schema, and then at the end, you can query. But all you wanted to do was query the data. Why did you have to write a parser? Why did you have to maintain a schema? And Sparkle, and RDF world is a little bit different because there's no schema, there's no parser that you need to write, you can just store it, you can immediately query it. And as Mark will tell you that later, you can actually use Sparkle to drive web services as well. So you have one interface to both data and programs. Because we've always been very busy as programmers to optimize the CPU time, but we really need to make sure that the biologist's brain time is optimized because those are more expensive these days than CPUs. RDF, you know, has been around for a while now. So in 2006, when we started experimenting internally, we had 18 million triples, and that was a lot. It took a week to load, and we were very happy if a query returned results, which happened to be correct. These days, it's a little bit different. We now have 4 billion triples. It takes three days to load. 
you get actual correct answers from your Sparkle query, and Sparkle queries return actually very fast. So the RDF world has become practical to use even for large databases. Well, it's all very nice that you get this in RDF, but how do you make sure that your data is actually quality data? Well, I was thinking about why, and you start with lots of grapes, and none of them are useful, you squeeze them, and at the end, you get something which is really nice. Information and knowledge is very similar. You have lots of garbage, which you think is not very useful, and then after a lot of work, after a lot of squeezing, and a lot of effort, you get some very nice bubbles and something very tasty. So, same is true for protein database quality, which really starts with, you have to be careful. In our case, we have careful manual curation. So this is people, experts, who know about the biology of proteins, about all the information there, and they do very careful curation for other users. We have to pay attention all the time to make sure what we wrote yesterday is still true today, because knowledge moves. And to help all these people, we have a type of sanity checks. What's this? It's basically your spell checker in your Microsoft Word, which puts a squiggly line underneath every word and says, well, maybe you mistyped it. But of course, like every biologist, you use lots of jargon, and you get lots of red little lines for very common words which you use every day. So we use highly trained curators, very many steps in our process to make sure that the data that gets integrated is correct. And we use very high quality supporting tools. And we like to think that we're as good as the science and the literature. We have to maintain and go along with all the changes in the biology because data mutates, because the information that people know about something changes. So we have to recheck all the time. And sometimes you really find that the original literature has been completely wrong. And in this release, you can actually read a very interesting story about we thought something was A, but it actually was Z, very far and very different. So how does Sparkle help with this? You think that's not very useful, but actually it is very, very useful. And how does, uh, we have always tried to do these automatic sanity checks, and we have this 10,000 line Perl script which does this. And basically it's 10,000 lines of different regular expressions. It's not easy to maintain, it's not easy to figure out what it's doing, so we're going to replace this with Sparkle queries. And Sparkle queries are very nice, and especially in spin way that they're done, because Sparkle query can actually be written down as RDF. So it's a completely natural way of dealing with Sparkle as actually being completely not different from RDF. And I'll give you an example of what the rule looks like. Because Sparkle is not just select, it's also building, constructing. So in this case, we construct a violation, a knowledge violation, a strength violation. So we basically say, we name the violation, which has a usable label. And that's basically saying, we have a protein with a link to the yeast database, but the protein is not from a yeast. Fix this, please. So, why is this given? Well, a very simple part. The basic says, well, for this is a protein, because we're talking about proteins, or peanut butter breakfast in this case. Well, where it has a link. And the link is to the database STD. Well, that's the yeast genome you know, database. So it has that link. It should take this warning, except if this thing is actually a yeast. And this is standard Sparkle 1.1, and it works at those different little stores. So it's really nice. It's a very simple way of encoding the knowledge using the data that we have to say, this is probably wrong, please have a look at it. And we maintain this in reaching a very simple tool, a very nice tool, Copyright Composer. It's a commercial tool, but you don't actually need to use it to develop it. And like every database, we have a legacy. We have lots of legacy because we've been around for more than 20 years now. So we have text files, we have Perl, we have C, and the Perl and C is not really modern Perl, it's Perl 4. Pivot Pro 5, Pivot Pro 6, because you know different programs come along. C, well, it's mostly 32 bit limited, but we need 64 bit machines. So lots of problems there. You have an external platform the format, which C plus plus code which goes along with it. And we have these editors which work on it. But we basically want to check with just one piece of logic. We don't want to rewrite the logic all the time. So 
So we convert all these formats on the fly into RDF, and then we have all these sparkle queries on the as required. We use this, do this using our Jive API. And the way we do that is by very simply wrapping each of these little rules in a small Java object. And then the rules are written in Drupal, and we just have this one Java object. The reason we do this, why do we use Java and Turtle? It's because it allows us to use all the knowledge that we already have about writing good software. So we genuinely test every single one of these rules with cases where it should trigger and cases where it should fail. So we actually have some good idea if the rules is testing what we think it's testing. And spin and RDF has a bit of a network effect. Because we think like, oh, it's very nice that we have rules. But actually what we find out is we need some quality rules of the rules themselves as well. Because we're finding that uh, as our data changes, we used to have a rule which says, well, everything with a certain NCBI tax ID, this is true for. Well, the tax ID changed. Or this, to put it this way, it was merged with some other organism, so the tax ID was no longer valid. So we needed to know this, but the person who felt uh, maintaining the rules hadn't paid attention. So we had 40% of our rules was no longer valid. It was testing things which were no longer required. So it's very nice if you can actually test your rules to make sure that they're still good. The other thing is that reasoning supports spin rules. It was a rather public example was that we had made a little mistake with an owl same as. And basically what had happened was that the reasoning was that, well, there's Arnold Italiana, it's a nice little black, it's actually an insect. So that was a reasoner error. And this really was an error. So, and the other thing is we have cardinality constraints on our owl. And if you use a close world assumption, you can say very nice things about what your data should have. PDB record should have one resolution. And it significantly reduced the number of duplicate rules that we have. So a little bit about our case. So we have this very simple case. We have one input entry linked to the PDB entry. The second input entry also linked to the PDB entry. But these two input entries both said something different about that PDB entry. So we have this data inconsistency issue. Either A was wrong or B was wrong. We didn't know which one was wrong, we just knew that one was wrong. And the way we found this was that the reason I told it this was detected by an owl user and said, you're being inconsistent here. Figure out what's going on. It was not expected. We didn't write any code to test for it because we never thought that this mistake would be made. But the mistake was made and somebody had to go and fix it. So how was this case? Well, this is the little data property. It's a resolution, has an annotation. It's a functional property, which is very important. Because basically what the functional property said that it is unique for this resource. So we didn't have two possible values, it's only about one value. We couldn't have a PDB record with two resolutions, only one resolution per PDB record. So it was a real problem, it was really detected almost for free without any major effort in our case. So at the quality of our creation effort, it improved without any major investments. So that was very nice. So as a conclusion, how and Sparkle we work together, they're mutually beneficial, because the reasoning helps making queries easier. And here we have about 60 R classes, and currently about 110 rules, which should be quite a lot more. And in really in conclusion, it's all these other technologies that you know, you've used before, key values, you can do this job. Spark and Owl just makes it cheaper to do it. And the really nice thing is, you can actually share it afterwards. I can pass you my Sparkle query. I, it makes it very difficult to do this with my PLSQL, having my Oracle databases, when you are using your MySQL database. So it's the only one which is actually a shareable quality issue. So this is basically been my uh, talk. And uh, thank you for your time. If you have any questions about input data, you can send them to help at unipod.org. But if you have any questions about this talk, you can either send them to Twitter, and I'll answer them there, because I think with the time constraint, it's maybe not good to have a question-answer session. 
So I think I hope that the next speaker is ready. And uh, I look forward to your questions on Twitter. Thank you. 